good to see you this morning. If you have your Bible, would you please turn to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. And the title of this sermon is, When God Closes the Door. When God Closes the Door. We are in Genesis chapter 7 in our study through Genesis, which in my opinion is probably the most important book in all of the Bible. Why is that? Because if you do not get the foundation of Genesis, everything else will be suspect. If you cannot believe the first ten words of God's Word, namely that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, if you cannot believe that, you might well question everything else He said. God's Word is absolutely true. God's Word fails not. Not a jot or a tittle will pass from the law until all of these things are fulfilled, Jesus said. And I want you to think with me on the subject, when God closes the door. We're in Genesis chapter 7, beginning with verse 13. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, by the way, he mentions them now twice. These children of Noah, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, notice the word kind, that's very important, and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark, that's the second time he has said that, Verse 13, now verse 15. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, verse 16 is the third time, those that entered, male and female of all flesh, entered fourth time as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. And the Lord closed it behind him. I want you to notice something but even really before we get into the sermon this morning, and that is what is listed in verse 16. Notice that it says, those that entered male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed the door. Isn't that interesting? He uses the word God. He uses the word Lord. If we were to read it in the Hebrew word, we would read it this way. They entered as Elohim had commanded. Elohim is a a more general term for God. It can be plural. It can be singular. And Elohim, they entered as Elohim had commanded him, and Yahweh closed the door. Yahweh is that word, that name that God gave to Moses in chapter 3 of Exodus. When God said, I'm sending you, and Moses said, who shall I tell them is sending me? And God said, I am that I am is sending you. That's the word Yahweh. So they went as God commanded them, and Yahweh closed the door. Isn't that interesting? Because if we just read the story of Noah, we might somehow think that he pulled that door shut, and he did not. God shut the door. We are reading about, of course, the great flood upon the earth, a very real flood, by the way which covered the entire earth, by the way. Why do you need to say that? Because you and I are living in a day where all of God's Word is doubted, and none more so than the flood in Noah's day. It was a worldwide flood. In fact, interestingly enough, the other day I was reading about how much water there is on the earth compared to how much land there is on the earth. The the earth is about 71% oceans, water, about 29% land. If you were to take all, and it it reminded me that when the Titanic sank, it's two miles below the ocean. That's a long way. But it reminded me that I was reading something that said, if you were to take all of the water in the ocean and cover America with it, just America, it would be 107 miles deep all over America. Think about that. Isn't that interesting? God destroyed the world with a worldwide flood. In fact, You can go on down to verse 19, if it were not clear enough, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. It really can't get much clearer than that. It was not a localized flood. I've read that through the years where somebody says, well, it was really a localized flood. It didn't, it wasn't, and I don't know why somebody wants to say that kind of thing because it's not true. It was a worldwide 
flood, just as God said. By the way, that is why they find fossils all over the globe, fossils. Animals do not normally become fossils. Normally, when an animal dies, it is scavenged by some other animal, and it ultimately rots into the ground. Fossils are the exception, not the rule. And yet, all over the world, we find beds of millions of fossils. Isn't that interesting? That is why also they find rapid burial of plants and animals all over the world. That is why they have found over 7 trillion tons of vegetation buried in the coal beds on every single continent, including, I might add, Antarctica. Plants and animals buried so quickly that they could not run from it, covered over immediately. How does all of that happen? They have found fish buried that were so exquisitely preserved that even the details of their fins and their eye sockets are still intact. They have found, in fact, I read this, this again this week, they have found what they call trilobites. Trilobites is, is a strange looking little thing. It, it looks like a little horseshoe crab, but it's very, very small. They have found trilobites so preserved, listen to this, that even the lens systems in their eyes can be studied. Now, how could something be buried so very quickly? By the way, I didn't know what a trilobite was. And so I looked up trilobite. And it said a trilobite is a marine anthropod. That didn't help. A marine anthropod. It, as I say it, so, so I called up some pictures of it. It looks like a little horseshoe crab, sort of. But they're supposed to be very hardy, uh, very strong, able to withstand lots of things. They are finding them everywhere. In fact, scholars, so-called, tell us they first appeared at the beginning of the Cambrian period. That was about... 542 million years ago. Now listen, when you read or hear anybody say 542 million years ago, you can just discount anything else they say. They are guessing. They are guessing apart from God. They are trying to explain things apart from God. But you see it everywhere today. It's not even a theory anymore. In fact, you can get a cereal box, and on the back of it, it will be a dinosaur that existed how many ever millions of years ago. No, God created them, and he created the whole world, and truthfully, he created it all about 6,000 years ago. You say, are you sure? I am absolutely sure, and I'll tell you why in a moment. This earth is not billions of years old, regardless of what your cereal box might say. It has become universal upon an attack on the Word of God to try to discredit what God's Word says. We need to say that we are not billions of years old for at least three reasons. One, because it has become an universal attack on the Word of God. God couldn't be more clear in Genesis 1 and the first day and the second day and the third day. couldn't be clearer. But we are seeing in our world today, Satan has never changed his tactic his tactic in chapter 3, verse 1 is his tactic today. What happened in chapter 3, verse 1? He comes to Eve and he says, did God really say? And he does that today all over the world. Can he get you to doubt the word of God? And so we need to talk about it because it is an universal attack on the word of God. We need to say it because our children will hear plenty of millions of years. Millions of years. Thirdly, we need to say it because they are specially created by God and are absolutely not a result of a marine athroid, a, a, arthropod called a trilobite. <laughs> they are specially created by the Lord. Well, what are some of the evidences that we are not billions of years old? I'll just mention several of them very quickly. You ready? Here we go. One, the oldest tree ever found. You ever think about that? The oldest tree ever discovered is a bristlecone pine tree in Wheeler Peak, Nevada. That's the oldest tree they've ever found. By its rings, it is dated to be at 4,300 years old. Now, why is that so important? Because if we're billions of years old, we ought to have trees that are way older than that. But the oldest tree we've ever found is 4,300 years old. In fact, they named it Prometheus. <laughs> you may remember that Prometheus was the Greek mythological god who supposedly created the world and stole fire from the humans. They named it Prometheus. In fact, sometimes Prometheus is the hero of the Greek flood story, and there are numbers of flood stories all based on what God has done. 
By the way, sad little Prometheus was cut down in 1964 by a student at UNC Charlotte who was doing his doctoral work in geology. He needed some samplings and got permission to cut down Prometheus. Hadn't that made you upset all week long? His name, by the way, was Donald Curry. As I say, he was a grad student at UNC Chapel Hill. And so the Prometheus tree was soon replaced by what they have named the Methuselah tree, the oldest tree alive. Another bristlecone pine that was found in the Inyo National Forest of White Mountains, California. But even it is dated at 4,852 years old. Here's my point. If we're so old, we ought to have trees that show that. Secondly, the oldest reef in the world, you know, may know, is the Great Barrier Reef right? You've heard of that. Off the coast of Queensland, Australia, that reef system is composed of some 2,900 individual reefs and 900 islands stretching over 1,400 miles. It is the biggest structure ever made by living organisms, composed of billions of tiny organisms known as, and this may be on your final, coral polyps, the Great Barrier Reef. Scientists have been measuring that reef for years now. And when you date it back, they find that it could not be more than 4,200 years old, the Great Barrier Reef. Isn't that interesting? Is there a third ob observation? Sure. How about Earth's slowing rotation? Earth's slowing rotation. Now, you may know that the sun's heat causes winds to go from the north to the south. The rotation of the Earth causes winds to go from the east to the west. Maybe you knew that. That is called the Coriolis Effect. And it is proportional to the Earth's rotation. That is changing and is continually measured. You may know that the rotation of the Earth is slowing at about 0.008812 seconds per year. If the Earth were, here's my point, if the Earth were billions of years old, it would have been traveling so quickly nothing could live on it. Nothing. So when they say it's billions of years old, they've got a lot to prove. Here's another. How about the Earth's declining magnetic field? Are you aware that the magnetic field of the Earth is declining? Studies over the last 140 years show a decl declining of the Earth's magnetic field. At the current rate, as little as 25,000 years ago, the magnetic field would have been so major that life could not have been supported here. One more. How about the salt in the oceans? When you go to the oceans, you know how salty it is. You try to get it in your mouth, and it's nasty. But if we were billions of years old, can you imagine how much salt would be in our oceans? Let me just share with you. The water in our oceans contains about 3.6 dissolved minerals, which we call salt. For years, scientists have been measuring that. We know that an estimated 457 million tons are deposited annually while 122 million tons leave the ocean through various methods. If evolution were true, the oceans would be so salty that nothing could live in them. And even if you accept evolution, which I certainly do not, the salt in the ocean, the earth could not be more than 62 million years old. By the way, it's not near 62 million years old. Why say all of that? Well, one is because of the unrelenting attacks on the Word of God. Another reason is because our children and many of our adults will not hear anything like that in this world that we're living in. Here's a third reason. Because there's a general denial of God in our society. If I can pers be persuaded that God doesn't exist, then why would I need to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ? If I got here apart from God, I don't need him today. And that's where we're living in America today. In fact, as I was thinking about that, you might have heard last week that they think they have maybe, possibly, supposedly, hopefully, maybe found life on Venus. Did you read that last week? Well, aren't you glad you're here? Last week, scientists found some, it's called phosphine gas in the clouds over Venus. They're all excited about it because it means there just might be life on Venus. So I decided to print out the article. Here it is. The world was shocked on Monday with the announcement that strong evidence of life on Venus has been discovered. By the way, it's titled, Venus Studies Reveals Surprising Evidence of Life. What you should know. That's important because how they end the article. Let me just read a couple of them. 
The findings are quite exciting, but it should be noted that life on Venus has not been found. Rather, the study indicates the presence of a biosignature, evidence of the potential presence of life on the planet. This is important distinction because life has not at this time been confirmed in the Venetian atmosphere. It goes on to say, this new study points out that the other potential sources of the phosphine gas, other potential sources of the phosphine gas are possible. Why don't they just say that? including something of, quote, unknown photochemistry or geochemistry in addition to the potential the presence of the presence of life. More research and findings will be necessary. And I'm going to read you the last of it. Listen to this. Phosphine gas is uniquely associated with life on Earth, that is. Though the gas is found in some other parts of the solar system, it is limited to gas giants, not rocky planets where it would be quickly destroyed in the atmosphere. For this reason, the study notes that phosphine gas... Last sentence... For this reason, the study notes that phosphine gas, quote, meets most criteria for a biosignature gas search, but it isn't enough on its own to make the declaration of the discovery of life beyond Earth. Now, did you hear that? It doesn't give enough to, to guesstimate to make a declaration of the discovery of life on Earth. Then why did you name it Venus Study Reveals Surprising Evidence of Life? Do you see the utter idiocy in this? We're not sure about anything, but we think we found life. Here's my other aspect of that. Isn't it interesting that this atheistic guesswork of people who refuse to believe in God, they will find a gas and think they have found life while they refuse to acknowledge that life in the womb is a human being. Isn't that interesting? It is unbelievable. They will look for gas on a planet and make all kinds of suppositions, but refuse to say that that little one growing in the womb with a heartbeat and brain waves is a human being. That's the world we're living in today. They haven't found life anywhere. Oh, by the way, here's another article. Scientists believe there may be life on the moon that traveled there from the earth. And so they are saying that an unmanned Israel, Israeli spacecraft, the Bereshit, was carrying a few thousand tiny tardigrades. 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 You know what a tardigrade is. No, I, nor do I. They are the hardiest creatures on our planet. When this, apparently this, this Israeli spaceship lost control and crashed on the moon, and apparently it took some tardigrades with it to the moon. And now they probably are reproducing, and who knows what's going on up there. That's where this is heading. So what is a tardigrade? Well, you might want to pay attention because you might have come from them. You ready? Also known as water bears or moss piglets, tardigrades look like eight-legged maggots with puckered mouths. Isn't that interesting? And they're saying it could have survived the crash of that spaceship and just maybe, maybe, everything's going along and in a few billion years, these eight-legged <laughs> maggots with puckered mouths. How different from King David who wrote in Psalm 139, 14, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Amen? We are created by the Lord God. Maggots. Could you imagine? David goes on to say, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So I suppose if you, and don't do this, but if you called someone an eight-legged sucker mouth maggot, you might be right. Apparently, scientifically speaking, and you could add that, scientifically speaking, so we get all excited about maggots, but we'll not declare that a baby in the womb is human life. That's the world you and I are living in. That's the kind of reasoning that comes when a person says in their heart, I will not honor God. Read Romans 1 again. They would not give the glory to God, so they became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was dark, and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the created beings for the Creator. Why is that so important? Because we're talking about Genesis and how all of that began God in Genesis 7 sends a worldwide flood on the earth and destroys every living thing for the very type things that you and I are facing in our world today. As I mentioned earlier, the animals that were taken on the ark would not have been full grown. They would have been little baby animals 
who would grow up able to reproduce. There was no reason to take full-grown animals. So honestly, when we look at a picture of Noah's Ark and these big, tall giraffes are sticking their heads out, that's wonderful, but that's not really the way it was. And even the dinosaurs, by the way, since we're mentioning dinosaurs, the average dinosaur was not like a bronchiosaurus. They were about the size of a dog, the average dinosaur. You had the exceptions, the big ones, but most of them were not. Here's my point, and I want to say this to our adults who know it and to our children who ought to know it. You can trust God's Word. Whatever you hear anywhere, base it and compare it with God's Word. Animals, when they die, as I say, do not normally become fossils. Humans do not normally become fossils. When something dies, it's almost always scavenged or done away with. A fossil is created when, when it's very quickly covered over. So I would ask, why are we finding, finding marine fossils 30,000 feet above sea level in the Himalayas? Answer that for me. Well, they do have an answer. They believe that at some point an asteroid hit the earth just right and changed everything. It is easier for them to believe in an asteroid than to believe in the God of heaven. We find billions of fossils, actually more specifically straight shelled chambered nautiloids fossilized with marine creatures. One of the places we find them is in the Grand Canyon. There's a seven foot thick layer within the red wall limestone of the Grand Canyon that is not just in the Grand Canyon, but covers continents, that same layer, continents. How do you explain that? In fact, it stretches ultimately 180 miles across northern Arizona and ultimately southern Nevada. It covers an area of some 10,500 square miles. This layer of fossils. How do you explain that apart from God? I can assure you it was not an asteroid. I can assure you that it was the judgment of God on a wicked world. I had one of our members call me this past week, interestingly enough, and he said, I hate to bother you, but can I talk to you for a moment? I said, sure. He said, well, I don't want to discourage you. He said, but this world has gone crazy. I said, oh, yes, it has. He said, we're seeing things that we would have never imagined in our nation today. I said, oh, yes, we are. He said, I believe the Lord's coming is very soon. I said, oh, yes, it is. Because we are living in everything that God said would precede the rapture of the church. We are living in the days of Noah. In fact, Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, Jesus said his coming would be like the days of Noah. What were those days characterized by? Two things, wickedness and violence. Are we seeing that today in Luke 17, 28? Jesus said his coming would be like the days of Lot. Are we living in the days of Lot today? Well, to ask it is the answer, it isn't it? And hatred, what about hatred? Jesus said in the last days, Matthew chapter 24, verse 7, ethnic group would rise against ethnic group and kingdom against kingdom. Are we seeing that in America today? Of course we are. You have to realize that our time on earth is very short. You have to realize that our Lord's coming is very near. Here's another reason why we're seeing all of these things. Listen, because Satan knows his time is short. Satan knows not only is his time short, his doom is sure. Amen? That's why he's pulled out all stops. He's pulled out all stops to lead mankind into the very pit of a place called hell. And listen, a person doesn't have to do anything to go to hell. Just stay where you are. The broad way of destruction, we're already on it until we give our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. You do not have to find the broad way. Jesus spoke of that in Matthew 7, 13. Because of sin, every person is on that broad way. No, you have to find the narrow road of salvation. In this flood that God sent upon the earth, mankind had decided he would live without God. In fact, mankind decided that pleasure and profit were more important to him than serving God. In that flood, you may well know, only eight people were saved. Just eight. Think of it. Just eight. Just eight. In an entire world given to wickedness and violence, there were just eight people. Eight people. One family that didn't budge and didn't bend. They trusted the God of heaven in a wicked day. The more wicked their world became, the more they found their peace in God Almighty. So God warns Noah what he's about to do. Noah begins building that ark. 
and he begins preaching to anybody who will listen. Second Peter chapter two, verse five says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. For some 55 to 75 years, Noah's worked on that ark and preached to the people. And listen, not one person took him seriously. Not one person cared enough about what God was going to do to get their lives right with him. On the contrary, the more he preached, the less they believed it. And the nearer the judgment came, eight saved because they trusted in the word of God. I thought about that this past week when I was reminded that Hurricane Sally dumped 30 inches of rain on several areas. In fact, some of the places said they got four months of rain in four hours. Isn't that interesting? We, like Noah's day, are living in a time of unspeakable wickedness and rampant wanton violence. We're living in a day where churches are being persecuted while perversion is being applauded. God saw that mankind had become increasingly violent and wicked. That's found in chapter 6, verses 5 and 13. God is grieved in his heart that he ever made man. Grieved in his heart. And he tells Noah, Noah, 120 years is all that's left, and I'm going to destroy this world. And as God always does, he provides a way of salvation. In chapter 6, verse 14, he tells Noah to build an ark for the saving of his family. Why? Chapter 6, verse 9, because Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. That tells us that even in a world that had decided to do its own thing, it was still possible for someone to honor the Lord and serve the Lord. Noah, his very name means rest or comfort, or consolation, is told to enter the ark when he's 600 years old, verse 11. They enter the ark, and God brings the animals, two of every kind, and two, seven pairs for sacrifice, verse 2. They enter the ark. In fact, verse 5 sums up Noah's life. He did all that God commanded him. Then notice chapter 7, verse 4. God gave them seven more days. I mentioned this, well, it's about to be 1140. The last trump in Israel is going to be sounding. As I thought about that, are we ready to meet the Lord? But then I thought about this, verse 4, chapter 7 of Genesis. God said, yet seven more days and I'm going to destroy the world. Is God going to give us another week because we're, his coming is like the days of Noah? Does that include we're going to get seven more days? I am saying to you and me, be ready to meet the Lord. Be ready to meet the Lord. For 120 years, God has not acted yet. For 120 years, the world gets worse and worse and worse, and Noah keeps preaching. So I want you to notice five quick things this morning. Number one, Noah's faith is honored, verses 13 through 15. Noah and his sons are named again to tell us at least two things. One, to honor Noah and his family and their faith in the Lord. But secondly, to show that of all the people living on the earth, only Noah and his family believed God. I would add a third, and that would be this, that what God says he's going to do, he's going to do. What God says he's going to do, he's going to do. You can trust God's word more than you can trust the word of anybody or anything else. How many people were on the earth then? Well, that's an interesting question. So I looked up answers in Genesis, those who run the ark in Kentucky. They suggest there would have probably been around 750 million people on the earth in Noah's day. 750 million people. Makes it all the more hard to believe that 750, well, 742, well, 700 million, or whatever that it comes up to. I'm sort of like uh, Jethro on the Beverly. I have to take my shoes off to count much higher than that. It means, uh, it means all the world except eight people trusted the Lord. All the world except eight people did not trust the Lord. The eight people did. Now, Answers in Genesis says our birth rate in 2000 was a growth rate of about 0.012%. If you add that, there could have been up to 4 billion people on the earth in Noah's day. Here's the point. Only eight. Only eight were saved. Secondly, God's creation is affirmed. Notice the word kind in verse 14. The word kind, here's what that means. Here's what kind means. It means he took the types of animals, not every animal. Okay? All the animals went into the ark after their kind. Every type was saved, not every animal was saved. 
No one doubts that there are all kinds of dogs. For example, they, they have, but they have this in common, they're all still dogs. You might have big dogs, little dogs, pretty dogs, less pretty dogs, black dogs, brown dogs, yellow dogs, white dogs, short-legged dogs, long-legged dogs, cold dogs, and hot dogs, but they are all still dogs, amen? Not in a million years will a dog turn into a cat. Besides that, why would it want to? God took all the kinds of the animals on the ark, okay? All the kinds of the animals. No one denies that species change and adapt, but they do not become something else. The only time an animal becomes something else, listen carefully, the only time something becomes entirely something else is in the science books and the museums in America. That's the only time. God took the kinds of animals on the ark. Thirdly, God's order is demonstrated. Look at verse 15. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh and which was the breath of life. God does everything in order. Amen? That's why everything in his church is to be done in order. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. God is a God of order. God is a God of order. You go out at night and look at the stars and the reason the astronomers can tell us this is that and that is that is because God is a God of order. God is a God of order. Notice also these animals were tamed and under the power of God. Noah did not have to chase them and he did not have to fear them. God is directing all of it. Number four, God's care is evident. Look at verse 16. I thought about that this week. Isn't it remarkable that God saved the animals too? Isn't that interesting? You ever thought much about that? God didn't have to save the animals. God could have, with a word, created every one of them once again, but he saved the animals. Isn't that interesting? Julie and I have been talking this week. If the Lord comes in the rapture and we're gone that quickly, what's going to happen to our little Callie? Can I tell you what I honestly think is going to happen? I think Callie's going to go right with us. Why is that? Because God takes care of his creation. We don't need to worry about it. We don't need to add extra food so they'll be okay if we're not. God's going to take care of it. And, when, and, if, and, if, and if Callie's following us and she's not there yet, I'll just say to the Lord Jesus, would you please go get Callie for us? God loves his creation, amen? And no wonder Romans says all of creation groans for redemption, all of it. Not just us, but all of creation. God's care is evident. And by the way, this is the second time God has mentioned that. Verse 9 mentions it too. Now, he, sin, he brings the animals not so that they can be worshipped. He brings his creation not so that it can be worshipped, but that so they can be enjoyed. They can be enjoyed. By the way, and we'll close, you, when, when a person rejects God as, as all of these did, when a person, listen, when a person rejects God, they don't cease to worship they just worship something or someone else. The person who says, well, I'm not going to give my life to the Lord. I don't worship God. They don't cease to worship. They just worship something else in place of God in their life. It could be a material thing. It could be a sports hero. It could be a great singer. It could be something else. It could be any number of things, but it's something else to worship in place of, in fact, it could be, and most often is, themselves, though they won't say that. I'm not going to worship God because I'm going to do my own thing. What are you saying? You're saying, I'm going to be the king of my life, and I'll do what I want to do, and you're worshiping yourself. And that's what was happening in Noah's day. Lastly, God's grace is ended. Verse 16, those that entered male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him, and Yahweh closed the door behind them. That means that for all of those years of building the ark, the door was open. That means that even after Noah and his family and the animals entered the ark for another seven days, the door was opened. There was still grace. There was still time to be saved. God gave another seven days. In Matthew chapter 24 in the New Testament, I want to read these verses as we close. Matthew chapter 24 Verse 37, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. 
For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. If every word of God is true, and it is, if every syllable of God's word is true and important, and they are, then it seems that when Noah entered the ark, the people around him, at least temporarily, stopped all of their partying, partying just for a moment. It says, until the day that Noah entered the ark. I would imagine that Noah's preaching now more than ever in these last seven days was with a tear in his eye saying, please, please, please listen to the word of God. I would imagine that now more than ever there was a yearning in his voice, pleading. Some of these were no doubt his friends, pleading with them to trust the Lord, trust the Lord. And he was met with a disdain that is unreasonable. He was met with a scoffing and a rejection. He knew that those who were listening to him were not just rejecting God, they were frittering away the last days of their life and judgment was coming. Yet, as we well know, not a single one of them believed and they all perished. Can you imagine things were going on as usual? In fact, that sixth day and maybe that seventh day morning, it was more pretty than it had ever been. And maybe they said to Noah, Noah, honestly, look, there's not a cloud in the sky. Are you serious? God's not going to do anything. Look, Noah, you got eyes. And Noah once again would say, oh, believe the Lord, believe the Lord, believe the Lord. And then Yahweh himself said, Noah, I'm closing the door and the door shut. And you can imagine as the clouds began to form and suddenly it started raining and they began to say, Noah, we believe now, we believe now, open the door, open the door. And he couldn't open it because God had shut it. Here's my question for you. Are you in the ark of God of safety? Are you outside of the ark in rebellion? There's no two ways to be other than those. If you're not saved this morning, give your heart to Jesus today, today, today. I had not many times, but I've had on occasion somebody say to me, well, preacher, I tell you what, I had one say it exactly this way. I'm going to sow my wild oats and then I'm going to give my life to the Lord. And I didn't want to call them a name to their face, but foolish came to my mind very quickly because they are assuming a number of things. First of all, that they're going to be here another day of their life, but they are making a grand assumption that somehow life apart from the Lord is preferable to life lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. And there couldn't be a greater lie. The greatest peace and joy in all the world is when we know our hearts are settled in him, settled in him. If you're not saved, give your life to Jesus today. If you've grown cold in your relationship with the Lord, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe there was a day when you were very excited about the Lord, but you've fallen away from him. You've turned your back on him. Today, he says to you, get your heart right. Get your heart right. And then, if you are looking for a wonderful church of people, we receive members by statement of faith, by baptism, and by letter. If you want to be a part of our church here, we welcome you to do that as well. But I'm saying to us on this last of the Feast of Trumpets Day, and in a world that is so much like not Lot and Noah, I'm saying to us, let us be in the eight who trust the Lord, who trust the Lord, and stand firm in these days, because God's judgment on this world is absolutely certain, and his rapture is the next thing on his timetable. And I want us to all be there together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. If ever there was a generation that has seen such a tax on your word, it's our generation. If ever there was a day when we are not unlike the days of Noah, where preachers preach, 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 and the world just gives a big yawn to it and says, we're too busy to think about that. I pray today that millions upon millions will come to faith in Jesus Christ. 
And I pray, Lord, for every person who says they are a Christian. May every single one of us rededicate our hearts to you today to be more on fire for you, more obedient to you than we've ever been in our life, more looking for your promises and your work than ever before. Is our prayer today in Jesus' name, amen.